a el caso 13095 eh, con respecto de Jamaica. Eh, hago un saludo especial reconociendo la presencia de los peticionarios de esta audiencia. Eh, lamentamos que hoy eh, no esté la representación del de Estado. Eh, quiero declarar abierta la presente audiencia en la que escucharemos precisamente las alegaciones para este caso que he señalado por parte de el, el, los peticionarios. Voy a darle la palabra a la secretaria adjunta, Marisol Blanchard, eh, para que nos ponga en el contexto del de caso para el conocimiento de, la, eh, de las personas que participan en la, en la misma y quienes nos siguen a través de los medios. Esta audiencia difiere de las anteriores y vamos entonces, eh, Marisol, por favor. Gracias, Presidenta. La presente audiencia se refiere al caso 13.095 AB y SH respecto de Jamaica. El presente caso se encuentra en etapa de fondo y trata sobre el impacto que la ley de delitos contra la persona de Jamaica, la cual penaliza las relaciones sexuales consensuales entre personas del mismo sexo, ha tenido en las presuntas víctimas, quienes argumentan que han sufrido una serie de hostigamientos y actos de violencia derivados de su orientación sexual. Muchas gracias. Eh, quiero, eh, antes de, de darle la palabra a los peticionarios, hacer una explicación de lo que representa para la Comisión eh, la legitimidad de celebrar esta audiencia aún ante la ausencia del de Estado. Eh, el Estado fue notificado el 4 de, de octubre de este año, eh, haciéndole la eh, notificación de esta audiencia y de acuerdo a nuestro reglamento, que también voy a pedirle a, la, eh, a Marisol, por favor, que dé lectura al artículo 64 para que conste eh, la legitimidad de la celebración de esta audiencia. Gracias, Presidenta. El artículo 64 del Reglamento de la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos establece audiencias sobre peticiones o casos. Las audiencias sobre peticiones o casos tendrán por objeto recibir exposiciones verbales y escritas de las partes sobre hechos nuevos o información adicional a la que ha sido aportada durante el procedimiento. Número 3. Si la Comisión accede a la solicitud o decide celebrarla por iniciativa propia, deberá convocar a ambas partes. Si una parte debidamente notificada no comparece, la Comisión proseguirá con la audiencia y la Comisión adoptará las medidas necesarias para preservar la identidad de peritos y testigos si estos requieren tal protección. Muchas gracias, Marisol. Vamos a dar inmediatamente entonces la palabra para la presentación de los alegatos por parte de los eh, peticionarios. Tienen 25 minutos, pero como no está el Estado, les voy a dar 30. Good morning. Ah. Thank you. Thank you for allowing us to meet with you today. My name is Samir Varma. I'm with the law firm Thompson Hine LLP. I, along with my co-counsel, Sarah Bosha and Maurice Tomlinson, represent the petitioners, anonymously referred to as AB and SH, in the current matter before the commission. As you are aware, we're here today to discuss Jamaica's Offenses Against the Persons Act, 
particularly sections 76, 77, and 79, which criminalizes the attempted or actual crime of buggery committed with mankind, as well as any act of gross indecency by a male with another male. Now this law is a vestige of British colonial rule, yet it is fiercely defended by successive Jamaican governments since independence. It essentially turns consensual sex between adults into a status crime, whereby the very existence of LGBTQ individuals in Jamaica is criminalized. The act itself exerts multiple hazardous effects on Jamaica, and in particular, the LGBTQ community, including the petitioners in our case, AB and SH. AB and SH are young gay men from Jamaica. Each suffered multiple attacks, including gang assaults and mob violence from private individuals. Efforts to report these crimes to police resulted in indifference, inaction, and police harassment and abuse. Additionally, as men who have sex with men, they are at great risk of HIV. Petitioners experience constant debilitating stigma and discrimination due to their sexual orientation, such that accessing sexual health services was constrained. The act legitimized and encouraged the violence both petitioners experienced at the hands of private individuals and state actors alike, and justified the, the, government's, the Jamaican government's failure to provide adequate and non-discriminatory health services to these young men. The act both violates and makes possible violations of multiple provisions of the American Convention on Human Rights, namely the rights to non-discrimination and equal protection, rights to privacy, freedom of thought and expression, life, freedom of association, freedom of movement and residence, the right to participate in government, and importantly, the rights to health and the rights to a family. Similarly, the act directly contravenes the Jamaican Constitution itself, as well as legitimizes a social, legal, and political context permitting its violation. Now, before my co-counsel dive into how the petitioners' lives have been affected by the act, and in particular, how their fundamental rights have been threatened, I want to briefly touch upon the treatment of, of similar anti-sodomy laws in other jurisdictions, including other former British colonies. As the Commission is undoubtedly aware, there is a movement across the globe to rid legal precedent of anti-sodomy laws. While Jamaica continues to strip citizens of their fundamental human rights, countries like Belize, Trinidad and Tobago, India, Botswana, have all recently repealed similar anti-sodomy laws because of the resulting human rights violations. Specifically, in 2016, the Belize Code, which criminalized consensual sex between individuals of the same sex, was found to be unconstitutional because it contravened constitutional protections of equality, dignity, and personal privacy. In April 2018, the High Court of Justice in Trinidad and Tobago decriminalized same-sex intimacy between consenting adults on grounds that the laws violated LGBTQ people's right to privacy and freedom of expression. In, in September 2018, the Supreme Court of India struck down similar anti-sodomy laws criminalizing same-sex intercourse on the grounds that it violated individuals' fundamental rights to equality, life, and personal liberty, as well as freedom from discrimination. And finally, more recently, in June of 2019, the Botswana High Court struck down anti-sodomy laws, present as a remnant of British colonialism, as it violated rights to privacy, liberty, and dignity, and served no public interest. Jamaica must follow suit and decriminalize consensual, adult, same-sex sexual conduct to ensure that all Jamaican citizens enjoy the rights and freedoms to which they are entitled. I'd like to turn it over now to my co-counsel, Sarah Bosha. Good morning, councillors. My name is Sarah Bosha, a legal research policy advisor on HIV and human rights from AIDS Free World and also counsel for the petitioners. I'll begin by dispensing with the issue of admissibility. In 2018, a similar petition, or with similar facts, was filed by Gareth Henry, Simone Carleen Edwards, and families against Jamaica for its discriminatory offenses against the Person Act. In that particular petition, the commission ruled that the constitutional amendment of 2011 prohibits bringing a constitutional claim against buggery laws. The commission also acknowledged that when an action to challenge the act was brought before the Jamaican Supreme Court, it was subsequently withdrawn before determination on admissibility because of homophobic threats to the claimant. These combined factors led the commission to conclude that 
the exception to the requirement of prior exhaustion of domestic remedies set forth in Article 46.2A of the American Convention applies. I'd also refer the Commission to uh, Article 31A of the Rules of Procedure on Exhaustion of Domestic Remedies and argue that these particular exemptions apply to the present case as well. Now I'll move on to the right to health. The anti-sodomy law in Jamaica violates the right to health as protected by Article 26 and Article 5.1 of the American Convention. The law creates a hostile and homophobic environment in public health centers, making these spaces and the health services they provide inaccessible to LGBT people. The Pan American Health Organization and the World Health Organization have noted that governments have a responsibility for the health of their peoples which can be fulfilled only by the provision of adequate health and social measures, and that there is a need to develop policies that are inclusive and take into account the needs of the entire population with specific attention to members of vulnerable groups and high-risk areas. Respectful and non-discriminatory access to quality care is also consistent with the WHO Constitution, which recognizes the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health as a fundamental human right of every human being and the core responsibility of the governments that govern those people. Now, in Jamaica, the government has been derelict in this duty with respect to LGBT people. I refer you to the petitioner AB and his explanation of his own situation that led him away from health services that are supposed to serve every member of the Jamaican community. AB explains, I fled to Kingston and stayed with several persons, some of whom sexually and physically assaulted me. I was very small and could not fight back. I felt that I had caused those people to abuse me because I owed them something for letting me stay with them. I now realize that I was not at fault and what, people, what those people did to me was wrong. I never went to seek medical care after any of the assaults because I was ashamed of letting another man sexually and physically assault me. I knew that people would laugh at me if they found out. I was also too scared of going back to a public hospital and I did not have money for a private one. Unfortunately, this account of AB, this account of being scared to go to a public hospital, highlights some of the barriers many LGBT people and other sexual minorities face in failing to access healthcare in Jamaica. The WHO has noted that if people feel that confidentiality and privacy are not assured, they may decide not to seek services, which not only jeopardizes their own health, but the health of others around them. This kind of environment also negatively impacts adherence to treatment and retention of patients within the health system. A 2019 report put together by the Global Fund on Jamaica and with reference to the anti-sodomy law found that criminalization of consensual same-sex intercourse leads to stigma in healthcare facilities. The starkest example of the impact of the negative anti-sodomy law is on the right to health with respect to the fight against HIV. The anti-sodomy law drives LGBT people underground and away from essential HIV testing and treatment services. Petitioners' experiences demonstrate a wider problem, that the anti-sodomy law by criminalizing gay people creates an environment that prevents gay people from seeking HIV testing services, which in turn prevents effective treatment, care, and supporting services for gay people in state-run public health centers. The law legitimizes, even permits, homophobic attitudes by healthcare workers, making them hostile to working with sexual minorities, which compromises public health delivery. Both petitioners have complained about the hostile homophobic environment, which made it difficult for them to access HIV services and other sexual reproductive health services. Petitioner SH, SH states, I have found it difficult to obtain confidential, non-judgmental sexual health services in Jamaica. Because of the non-tolerance in Jamaica, persons find it hard being open because when you're getting tested, they normally tend to ask you your orientation if you're positive and you normally have to give a history of your sexuality. So, persons who are positive and gay may not know their status because of homophobia and fear, end of quote. 
Petitioner S.H. further explains, I refuse to be tested for HIV or other sexually transmitted infections at public health centers because I've heard from friends who are gay men or have sex with men that they often experience discriminatory treatment. They are asked about their sexual conduct. If they admit they had sex with a man, they are treated differently. I am concerned I will experience similar discrimination if I seek health services from providers who are not known in the LGBT community for their tolerance. He adds that, quote, I am lucky enough to be connected to JFLAG as a peer counselor, so I'm aware of how to access confidential and non-discriminatory services. Similarly, Petitioner AB shares his own experiences of seeking an HIV test in 2009, then age 17. He shares, I went for my first and only HIV test at a public health clinic in Jamaica. It was in my hometown of Spaulding's Clarendon. However, the treatment that I received caused me to leave the clinic before I took the test, and I refused to return to another public health care facility in Jamaica for any other medical care. At the clinic, I was met with hostile stares and jeers by the clinic staff and patients. I saw patients in the waiting area and nurses pointing and laughing at me while I sat for about an hour to be called for the test. I was intimidated by the atmosphere and just wanted to leave. I regretted going to the clinic very soon after I arrived." Close quote. Ultimately, Petitioner AB stated that, and I begin again a quote, the nurse handed me a questionnaire to complete. Among other things, it had questions about my previous sexual partners. I was afraid to fill it out truthfully because I'd only ever had sex with men, which is a crime in Jamaica. Completing the questionnaire would be admitting that I broke the law and could spend up to 10 years in prison. I also did not want to expose myself to further ridicule by admitting that I was gay. So when the nurse was not looking, I quickly gathered my belongings and left." Close quote. Sadly, this discrimination in healthcare facilities persists to this day in Jamaica. The 2019 Global Fund report I mentioned earlier noted stigma and lack of confidentiality in healthcare facilities is a common concern for people living with HIV, especially members of key and vulnerable populations. Healthcare providers may subconsciously discriminate against or mistreat LGBTI populations in pursuit of testing, treatment, and care of HIV. It cannot be denied that this society-based stigma that is experienced by sexual minorities in Jamaica largely stems from and is supported by the existence of this anti-sodomy law. The right to health in Jamaica does the right to health in Jamaica does not meet the standard criteria of acceptability, availability, accessibility and quality. This honorable commission has found in Poblete versus Chile 2016 that the right to health must meet the principles of accessibility, availability, acceptability, and quality. In Jamaica, we argue that this is not the current position. On accessibility, LGBT people do not enjoy discrimination-free healthcare services, as outlined by the uh, petitioner's declarations. Availability. There are no HIV and social and sexual reproductive health services that are tailored to LGBT people. And this is important because a 2014 UNAIDS country report on Jamaica pointed out that the anti-sodomy law limits the ability to provide comprehensive quality services to men who have sex with men due to fear of criminal punishment as a consequence of disclosure. Because of this law, Healthcare providers face specific challenges in providing quality care and services which increases vulnerability. As to acceptability and quality of services, the current hostile environment violates those ethics that bind healthcare workers to provide non-discriminatory services. The statistics show that homophobia is fueling HIV transmission in Jamaica. Men who have sex with men have the highest rates of infection, 28 to 30 percent, the highest in the Caribbean. HIV prevalence among gay and bisexual adolescent boys is 14 percent, while adolescent transgender is 27 percent. Further to that, 
The anti-sodomy law itself affects the right to health of LGBT and, fail, and makes Jamaica fail in meeting its obligations towards HIV control. In prisons, prisoners are reluctant to get tested for HIV because they fear that they would be perceived as men who have sex with men or as gay. This was confirmed by the 2019 Global Fund report, which stated that fellow prisoners refused to be tested or to access treatment because they were afraid of stigma and discrimination from corrections officers, staffs, and other inmates. The problem is, Jamaica is losing the fight against HIV because of its anti-sodomy law. In 2018, Dr. Tufton, the Jamaican Minister of Health, lamented that Jamaica was lagging behind in achieving its 90-90-90 targets. That is, 90% of Jamaicans know their HIV status, 90% of those who know their status are on antiretrovirals, and 90% of HIV-positive individuals are virally suppressed. In addition to the physical health problems, the anti-sodomy law also impacts the mental health of LGBT people in Jamaica. Research has found that the experience of LGBT intolerance and discrimination are connected to substance abuse, depression, and other risky behaviors. Petitioner SH, in speaking on his mental health, stated that, and I quote, to be gay in Jamaica is to live in hell because you live in constant fear. I am afraid of what might happen each time I leave the house to go about my business. I feel vulnerable and alone. Sometimes I am overwhelmed by sadness, and I don't even want to mention the stress and emotional baggage that comes from having been assaulted repeatedly. Mental health also has an impact on physical health. The Global Fund has noted that in Jamaica, stigma and discrimination is likely to influence adherence to antiretroviral treatment. People not wanting others in the community to know their status may defer or ignore or brush off taking their medication on time so as not to be identified as persons living with HIV. In closing, I would say this, commissioners. In order to address the inability of sexual minorities to access mental health and other health services in Jamaica, it is imperative that the anti-sodomy law be repealed. Criminalization hinders the creation of appropriate public health interventions and supports the prevailing homophobic environment that is present in the Jamaican health system. For as long as the law remains, homophobia will remain firmly entrenched in Jamaican society, making it impossible or even difficult to achieve equitable, accessible, and non-discriminatory protection and promotion of the right to health within the country. This commission has noted rightly so that Civil and political rights and economic rights are at par, interdependent and indivisible. The commission stated in Poblete versus Chile, both groups of these rights should be fully understood as human rights, without rank and enforceable in all cases. In the present matter, the petitioners pray that the commission find the continued existence of the anti-sodomy law violates Article 26 and Article 5.1 of the American Convention as they relate to the right to health. The law must be repealed, and mental and other health services in general, and more particularly to, in relation to HIV goods and services, be tailored to meet the needs of sexual minorities. I hand over to my colleague, Maurice Tomlinson. Excellencies, I'm Maurice Tomlinson, a senior policy analyst with the Canadian HIV AIDS Legal Network. I'm also a Jamaican attorney at law and a counsel for the petitioners. More importantly, I'm a gay man who has been working for over 26 years to end Jamaica's anti-gay law and the violence that it has spawned against the petitioners and other members of the Jamaican LGBT community, including myself. I've acted as expert witness in over 100 asylum hearings for LGBT Jamaicans who have had to flee their homes, jobs, and their homeland because of the sometimes near-death homophobic attacks that they have faced. They have been scattered to places as disparate as Argentina, Spain, the Netherlands, Germany, the United States, the United Kingdom, and Canada. In these new spaces, they have had to endure foreign and sometimes harsh climates, learn new and difficult languages, and basically rebuild their lives from nothing. 
During my over two decades of research, writing and reporting on the impact of this law, I have witnessed and documented the callous and cynical disregard for all our well for our well-being by successive Jamaican governments, which is amply evidenced by the absence of any representative of the Jamaican government here today. I will therefore apologize in advance if I get a little emotional when I make my presentation, because you see, I'm not just speaking for the rights of these two petitioners, I'm also speaking for my own rights as well. I've experienced only a small fraction of the persecutions that the petitioners faced, including multiple death threats, but they were still egregious enough for the IACHR to issue precautionary measures on my behalf in 2011 against the state of Jamaica. In 2011, the commission also issued precautionary measures on behalf of the petitioners, who suffered much worse violations than I did. But in neither my case nor that of the petitioners did the Jamaican government ever provide us with the security as requested by the, petition, by the, co the commission. The root cause of our ongoing abuse and neglect by the Jamaican state, as this commission has repeatedly highlighted, is the presence of the anti-sodomy law that makes the petitioners, me, and all other LGBT Jamaicans, at least in the minds of the Jamaican government and the majority of Jamaicans, unapprehended criminals with few, if any, human rights. That is why in 2015, when another Jamaican that I represented before the Supreme Court in a challenge to the anti-sodomy law withdrew because of death threats that he and his family faced, I decided to step in and file my own constitutional challenge to this British colonially imposed statute. Yet after four years of delay, we have not had a substantive hearing of my case. In fact, at another, the fourth preliminary hearing of this matter held just last Thursday, the government of Jamaica again asked for a further delay and advised the court that they would not be filing any defense to the human rights violations caused by the law. Instead, they said that they would only be advocating that the law is saved from judicial review by the savings law clause in the Constitution. And sadly, Jamaican courts contribute to this delay even though constitutional claims are supposed to be heard urgently because they touch and concern human rights. Excellencies, justice delayed is justice denied. This commission must act to give LGBT Jamaicans justice, and I pray that you will not fail us. I will not attempt to recount all the experiences of harm caused by the anti-sodomy law stated in the petition. Instead, I will let the petitioners speak for themselves. You have heard <laughs> you have heard that the continued existence of the law and the homophobia that it sustains have di directly compromised the right to health of the petitioners, other LGBT Jamaicans, and even the wider society. The same obtains for many other rights guaranteed under the American Convention. I realize, commissioners, that I have only one minute left. So I will conclude. Excellencies, we have supplied you with over 1,000 pages of information about extreme abuses suffered by the petitioners and other Jamaicans because of the anti-sodomy law and the homophobia that it supports. These documents include the petition, a 2019 addendum, a further declaration from petitioner AB with even more heartbreaking descriptions about the impact of the law on his life, a 2019 report by Jamaica's major LGBT organization detailing dozens of homophobic attacks since 2018, a very comprehensive report released just last week by the highly regarded Jamaican research firm describing the economic and societal costs of homophobia in Jamaica and the devastating impact of the anti-sodomy law on the health and well-being of all Jamaicans. A 2019 report on the negative impact of homophobia on Jamaica's HIV response by the Global Fund to fight HIV, AIDS, and tuberculosis and the Commission's own two reports on the human rights situation in Jamaica, as well as the 2015 groundbreaking report on violence against LGBT people in the Americas. Excellencies, there is undisputed and incontrovertible evidence of the disastrous, discriminatory, and sometimes deadly effects of this statute. It is now time to end it. You must find that Jamaica's continued retention of Section 76, 77, and 79 of the Offenses Against the Person Act violates the American Convention on Human Rights, and the state must repeal it now before anyone else is harmed. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Mi reconocimiento por...
la presentación de estos alegatos. Eh, vamos a darle la palabra a la relatora eh, para las, las colectividades LGTBI, Flavia Piovesan. Gracias, Presidenta. Thank you so much. I start expressing my deep gratitude and my deep recognition for your braveness, for your courage, for your commitment of being here, highlighting this dramatic situation. So count on us, count on our reportership. We are together in this challenge of facing such a discriminatory and violent, um, I'd say, consequence of this law. Um, so three points first. Um, as it was explained, the cases right now under the merits, we are just waiting for the response of the state. The state um, last October 24th asked, um, clarified that they would present their additional observations. So we are just waiting for those observations. And from the rapporteurship, we will ask for um, priority of this case because of the importance, because of the graveness. So uh, that's the first point. The second is that um, on behalf of uh, the rapporteurship dedicated to LGBTI persons' rights, we have three priorities. The first is to combat criminalization and violence against LGBTI persons in the language of state duties and rights. So we endorse the duty, the state duty, to adopt all the measures to investigate, to process, to punish, to repair violations, and to guarantee uh, the human rights of a, a, a free and a safe life. The second priority is to combat discrimination based on sexual orientation and identity rights. Again, we endorse the language of state duties and rights, so the state has the duty to adopt all the measures to prevent, to eradicate discrimination in order to provide the right of equality based on equality and non-discrimination. And our third priority is to foment a new culture based on equality, human dignity, non-discrimination. We just had last October with the UN, OS, the Commission, and the UN, and the Commonwealth, we organized a um, Caribbean consultation in Barbados, and one of the main topics was exactly the criminalization and the inclusion of LGBTI rights in the 23rd Agenda of Development, Sustainable of Development. So the idea was to get a better understanding for us, for the Commission, according to our strategic plan, uh, to get closer to the Caribbean is one of our, our priorities. So I'd say that here we, we met two priorities, to get closer to the Caribbean region and also to endorse the language of equality and non-discrimination. So that was a very important Caribbean consultation. It was the first with state representatives, with NGOs from different countries of the Caribbean region, and it was really a valuable and a very precious initiative to uh, identify which strategies we could follow after that. Um, I myself, and we have in the commission, and we develop research showing with all evidence that the criminalization per se as a consequence uh, endorses hostility, homophobia, violence, torture, uh, and all, and I would say systematic and cruel human rights violations. And for me, uh, it was really important, this hearing, even to consider the right to, the right to health, so not just civil political rights are directly violated, but as well as 
social rights and Article 26 of the American Convention, causing mental uh, depression and suicide. And there is even a, a, a research by the World Bank about even the economic cost of homophobia, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I have um, three questions. The first is considering this law, this 1864 law. Mm -hmm. Is there any discussion right now which was brought before the court about the inconstitutionality? Is, the, is, this, this, is there this current debate about constitutional, inconstitutionality of this law? Um, because I'm totally convinced that although it's not applied, mm -hmm. they say the Caribbean countries, there is a moratorium, mm -hmm. just the existence is a violation right. and implies a pattern of human rights violations. Um, and my second question is concerning um, the measures adopted by the legislative, executive, and judicial branch in order to uh, prevent discrimination, prevent viola violence based on LGBTI, uh, on sexual orientation and uh, gender identity rights, which are the measures? There is none, because according to your explanation, my feeling is that there is n nothing. Is there any measure that we can endorse, or um, what would be your position about this, this, this issue? And I mean, the case of the four cases, Belize, Trinidad and Tobago, India, and Botswana, give us empirical, empirical reasons for hope. But all of them were brought, I mean, all the, the, those, those victors was based on litigation, mm -hmm. judicial, um, judicial decisions. In the case of Jamaica, do you see an horizon for this, I mean, the judicial branch is open enough, is, is uh, it's, it's, I'd say, the, is there any hope that judicial branch would endorse this argument that the anti-sodomy law would violate privacy, equality, human rights, freedom of expression, and so on and so forth. So for, the, for us, for the commission, and especially on behalf of the rapporteurship, it will be very important to get from you all, you are there mm -hmm. experiencing, to get all the, co we had sessions there, <laughs> as another, uh, last May, so it, we could get some information, but from you, from your experience, if you could give us elements, then we could even, I'd say, identify better strategies, but just to express our commitment, our commitment towards the Inter-American Standards, and we are with you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Gracias, mm. Commissioner. Commissioner Puel, alguna intervención? Gracias, gracias, Presidenta. And I begin by uh, congratulating, congratulating councils here present for your presentation. Uh, it's very important for the Commission to, he to hear your oral arguments in this case, and uh, be sure that uh, all your statements have been well recorded and they will be um, uh, included in the file in order for the Commission to take a decision on this uh, very important case. I, I will not go into detail on the work of the Commission on protecting the rights of uh, LGBTI people, because my colleague uh, Flavia Piovesan, uh, she is the rapporteur and, and she is leading the work of the Commission and I'm leading a struggle in all the region in, in order to, to uh, ensure the protection of rights of uh, all LGBTI people. But I do want to, to, to express the importance of the system of uh, case of petition of the Commission in order to advance uh, public policies and the rule of law uh, in the region. And f when I always listen to cases relating to LGBTI, what immediately comes to my mind is the, the, the right of, to non-discrimination and the right to equal protection. Thank you. Thank you. And from there, the, we all, all other rights are derived. What you are telling us is in addition, some, we, we, there's a an, an very important element that there are other uh, uh, rights uh, in interplay 
both civil and political rights and social and economic rights, which must be looked by national bodies and by the commission with a differentiated approach. And I referred specifically to what I hear from the right to, to health, uh, the, uh, the, the vulnerability of LGBTI people, and, uh, and in that case, the, um, the, the higher standard that a state should be given in, uh, in order to, uh, to address the inequalities that uh, LGBTI people may be, may be faced, may be, f and, and may be f uh, facing, actually. Now, um, as you know, the Inter-American system has a complementarity role. And the, the, the commission acts when all uh, local remedies have been exhausted. And I'm, on, on a positive note on this, I, I recognize that uh, Jamaica as a state is a party to the convention, uh, to, to the Inter-American Convention on Human Rights. That's a positive uh, step forward in this, in this fight. Now, when the Commission decides on this, on this case, we will be looking into the reparation of uh, uh, possible rights uh, violated. But we will also be looking into measures of non-repetition. So that's the importance of, of a case which is brought to our attention because that is the, the, the most effective way to uh, address, uh, to promote actually structural changes uh, in, a, in a given country. And, uh, but for that, uh, we, we, we need also uh, to exercise our role of complementarity in a strategic manner. A strategic litigation is very important to move forward this, uh, this kind of agenda. So um, I've also heard uh, from you national uh, efforts that I, are, are taking place uh, in, in Jamaica, and my colleague, uh, um, Flavio Pivesan address a very important issue uh, at, at the national level. What I would like to hear is if there is any pending case before the uh, Supreme Court is uh, the Supreme Court of Justice of Jamaica, which are addressing the in inconstitutionality of the law of uh, 1864. Uh, it, uh, uh, Flavia mentioned it very rightly that through um, um, legal precedence, it was possible to promote changes in other countries. So it would be very interesting for us to know how, what's the status of, uh, of any possible strategic litigation in, 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 in Jamaica. Uh, all these are uh, of great help for us. Um, it's part of the oral arguments of, of the case. I don't want to, uh, to prejudice any a final solution to, to, to the case because it's, a, it's now um, um, in, 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 what's, the, what's the name? It's a standing. It's a standing, it's a standing, it's a standing uh, issue. But uh, what we have received from you is uh, it's quite, quite useful uh, in order for the Commission to have all, all uh, available information, especially from you, from uh, you as councils of the of the petitioners, it was very important to, to hear your position, and thank you. Gracias, Comisionado. Marisol, me ha pedido la palabra, sí. Thank you, President. I just have one question about the specific situation of AB and SH. Um, if you have um, presented any um, claims or any uh, judicial uh, position to address the threats and uh, the hostilities and the acts of violence that they have suffered. Gracias. Bueno, I, I will like to speak English, but my English is very bad. <laughs> Muy bien. Eh, voy a hablar en español. Eh, creo que para nosotros, para la Comisión, eh, poder escucharles en sus alegatos estos elementos eh, precisamente que sustentan la violación, ¿no están traduciendo? Traducción, por favor. ¿Ya? ¿No? 
está en el, en el mismo canal, ¿no? Es el canal 1 para inglés y español. Canal 2 inglés. Decía, ¿ve? que me hubiera gustado hablar inglés, pero no. Eh, para, para la comisión es muy valioso el análisis que ustedes plantean en sus alegatos, precisamente porque son los elementos que tenemos que tomar en consideración para eh, la debida caracterización de la violación de las normas convencionales y que eh, yo los, eh, para, para reafirmar, quisiera esa, la posición de, de ustedes, yo lo, lo ubico en la violación directa, de acuerdo a su argumentación, del de principio y el derecho de no discriminación, que recoge precisamente como decía, apuntaba muy bien el comisionado Joel, una, la, una serie de eh, otros derechos que se desprenden de efectivamente eh, est eh, estar en una eh, relación discriminatoria respecto de todas las instituciones. Ustedes han hecho énfasis en la institución de salud, que es fundamental eh, y que representa... Eh, precisamente poder determinar que todos esos actos de exclusión, exclusión en materia del de, eh, acceso al, al servicio público, además la intolerancia por parte de los propios actores de esta, eh, responsables de la, de la dotación del servicio, aún en los servicios eh, públicos, eh, representa eh, precisamente... Eh, 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 la comprobación o la, la forma de, de demostrar o caracterizar si existe allí definitivamente la violación de este, de este derecho. Entonces, mi, eh, yo, yo soy del, del criterio que, y no, no, no me corresponde dar una opinión, pero solo quiero destacar que en materia del de, eh, principio de la igualdad y de la dignidad humana para los grupos que enfrentan distintos factores de vulnerabilidad, es necesario que la Comisión pueda efectivamente plantear una posición que está recogida en nuestros estándares a través de nuestras distintas herramientas de trabajo y que así también ya lo ha identificado la propia Corte Interamericana. Una, una sola pregunta que me gustaría ver si eh, eh, ustedes, le, le, le escuchaba a, a uno de ustedes, el activista, eh, la presentación de casos. Eh, los casos de AB y SH están en, 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 la, en la justicia, eh, tienen decisión de la justicia, han puesto denuncias respecto de... De, de, de estos hechos, lo más probable es que en el análisis del caso eh, de seguro pueden, pueden estar, pero me gustaría porque precisamente eh, también lo que planteaba la comisionada Flavia y el comisionado Joel, ver de qué manera con nuestras decisiones, con nuestros planteamientos, podemos nosotros contribuir a la transformación de lo que... Eh, como, como una, una situación estructural es con, tener como contenido, como base legítima, entre comillas, eh, una, una ley, una ley que a, hace este eh, señalamiento muy puntual de la criminalización. Entonces, les voy a dar eh, cinco minutos para las respuestas. Y después, no se ría, eh, y después... Eh, un poco todo, todo lo que ustedes puedan hacernos llegar al, al, al caso, nosotros lo tomamos en cuenta. El tiempo aquí es un, es un duro. Thank you, commissioners. I will just respond to the question raised by Special Rapporteur Flavia on measures by leg legislative and judicial branches to prevent discrimination. Um, the Ministry of Health 
has been firmly seeking to end discrimination because they understand that there's an impact on service delivery when it's a criminal offense for you to, for example, uh, educate sexual minorities on safe sex practices. Um, I'll point to one or two policies. Um, they are all in the papers that we have given you, but just to highlight, the Jamaica's National Integrated Strategic Plan for Sexual and Reproductive Health. This is a 2014 to 2019 policy. In that specific policy, the Ministry of Health stated, and I quote, the offenses against the Persons Act, section 76, 77, and 79, criminalizes same-sex male intercourse and as such makes the promotion and facilitation of safer sexual practices among MSM an act which goes against the law. Um, the ministry, have, there's also a Jamaica National HIV Strategic Plan for men who have sex with men. This is a 2017 to 2019 plan. Um, which also identifies the problem we've just uh, stated to you, and it encourages the government to adopt, and I quote, a rights-based approach as guided by recommendations from the Human Rights Commission on HIV and the law, close quote. And we interpret this to mean repeal of the act. And I'll hand over to my colleagues for responses to other questions. I'll be quick, as quick as I can be. Um, so, excellent questions. and. In relation to other measures, the Jamaican Constabulary Force, which is the major police force, has instituted a non-discrimination policy with regard to sexual orientation. The challenge, of course, is that the policy and practice are still at odds because there hasn't been enough training, and this is where the disconnect happens. Um, so much to get through. Um, I thank you for your questions or comments on non-discrimination. As you have alluded to, time was our enemy, and there are lots of updates we could have provided on non-discrimination, but we can leave our speaking notes with you for further updates. Um, with regard to other cases, I will speak to two issues. One, have there been any cases brought by or on behalf of AB and SH in Jamaica? Um, that has been very difficult because it's difficult, if not impossible, to suppress the identities of persons when they bring cases. Uh, and this kind of matter would have exposed them and their families to death threats, which has happened, which happened in the case in 2013, which is why the petitioner in that claim challenging the anti-sodomy law withdrew, because he just couldn't deal with a number of death threats. So this is why we um, were very pleased to be able to bring the matter here, where the identities could be suppressed and provide a, a layer of protection. Um, as I explained in my introduction, I am now the petitioner, sorry, the claimant challenging the anti-sodomy law before the Jamaican court, the Jamaican Supreme Court, because the, cl the previous claimant had to withdraw because of death threats. Um, the status of that case is that since 2015, when the case was filed, we have not yet had a substantive hearing. Every time we go to court, there's been another delay, another delay, another delay. At the last delay, the government said it would not be addressing the human rights violations in this, um, in this case. It would only be speaking to the fact that they believe that the law is saved from any form of judicial review. So the court can't even look at it. You can't even look at whether it violates discrimination, the right to non-discrimination, right to um, you know, equality, none. It will not address that point. Instead, it has delegated its responsibility or <laughs> in clear dereliction of its duty to nine anti-gay religious groups which have been admitted into the case as interested parties, and they are arguing that the law is necessary to protect, I kid you not, to protect the extinction, to prevent the extinction of mankind, to protect children from rape by gay men, and to prevent the spread of HIV. These are the arguments in, so, in some which these religious groups have been allowed to make, and the court allowed these nine groups and denied the application by the public defender who wanted to be in the case to support me because literally right now it's me against nine religious groups and the government. And the public defender said she wanted to be in the case to at least provide support on the human rights implications from a positive side because all the religious groups are arguing from the negative side. The court denied her. The court said, among other things, that if she was allowed to support my case, it would undermine the office of the public defender because if she was seen to be supporting LGBT people, 
then nobody else with any kind of human rights violation would go to the public defender again. Right? These are actual reported case decisions. So the sad reality is we cannot get justice in Jamaica. It's either delayed or the courts have not taken the, uh, we think, the human rights perspective into account. Instead, they are deferring to the religious groups. In fact, the judge, when allowing in the interested parties, in his ruling said, it is important that the court hear if the majority of Jamaicans support a repeal of this law, which of course flies in the face of human rights principles and constitutional protections, which are supposed to be based on um, the idea that everybody, regardless of the majoritarian view, is entitled to human rights. I hope I've answered your questions. I, if, there, if I have not, I apologize, but we would be happy to provide follow-up responses. No, muy, muy completo, no, se, se cubrió todo. Bueno, eh, vamos a dar por concluida esta audiencia de un análisis de, 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 de fondo, agradeciéndoles eh, su participación y su tiempo. Muchas gracias y damos por concluida esta audiencia. <tose>